Hi there, folks. Merry Christmas. Keenan here over at Tales of Chimere and Illustrated Menagerie. I am a scientific illustrator and fantasy author. Most of my work is set in Chimere, a seed world speculative biology project that features the descendants of many animals extinct on Earth. In today's video, my last for the year, I have the pleasure of being included in the roster for Paleo Rewind, a series hosted by the Expeditioners Discovery Guild Enterprise, or EDGE. If you haven't already, I recommend you begin with Curious Archives and Paleo Analysis in their discussions of the discoveries and studies announced in January of this year. In the previous video in the series, Adasaur discussed major finds in the first half of June in 2021. Today I will be going over some of the major finds that caught my interest in the later half of the month, with particular emphasis on those which influenced my work on Chimere. A new species of Parasaurotherium was described during this time, found in northern China, which had a lot of interesting implications in the wide range and dispersal of this genus. As this new species was closer to those found further west in Asia than the more basal species described in this area. This study, which discussed among other things the benefits of being large when dispersing, influenced my inclusion of the Glanos to the eastern continent. Although Paraceratherium is not found in Chimere, the Glanos is a Calicathere which through convergent evolution is quite similar to this fascinating genus. There were two major announcements of archaic humans that I want to talk about today. Homo longi, based on an impressive skull, was officially named during this time. The authors and many others believe this is finally a type specimen of Denisovans, a lineage of humans famously discovered quite by accident when doing genome sequencing of a finger bone. There has been some pushback by the anthropologists about making this a new species, for reasons I'll get to in a moment. Another study explored the Nesha Ramla Homo, which is an interesting blend of archaic human and Neanderthal features and technology, suggesting a great degree of interaction between the two populations. These two studies influenced Chimere in that I am no longer officially calling Chimerans their own species. Between how much our ancestors and other archaic humans interbred, there's been a lot of doubt in such designations as Neanderthals, Denisovans, Homo heidelbergensis, and others actually being distinct species. As the ancestors of Chimerans diverged from our own ancestors a few hundred thousand years ago, making them more recent than Neanderthals and Denisovans, now Homo longi, if these two are lumped into our own as a subspecies, then Chimerans would logically be a subspecies too. The most influential discovery to Chimere in this time frame was a paper published by Dr. Holtz discussing the difference in predatory theropod diversity during the reign of tyrannosaurs. Compared to such ecosystem as the Morrison Formation, with a wide range of theropods from many clades and sizes coexisting together, where derived tyrannosaurids went, a trend seems to be in reduced predator diversity, particularly in those within a hundred and a thousand pounds. The reason for this is quite simple. Young tyrants filled these niches. By occupying several niches as they grew, tyrannosaurs put pressure on other predators. Since they took many years to grow, yet adults had many young per year, there were perhaps as many as a dozen tyrants of different growth stages for every adult in the given territory. Although this sort of phenomenon no doubt occurred with young of other apex theropods like Allosaurus, the prolonged juvenile stage of tyrants appears to have been enough of a force of pressure that diversity in populations of other predators in this size range was greatly reduced. In Chimere, where Megaraptorans have grown massive and share quite a lot in common with the tyrants before them, this situation is also seen in the ecologies where these predators are dominant. In the conifer rainforests, the most widespread and productive terrestrial ecosystem in the known world, between a quarter and half of the predators in this size range are young zentar, adults of which are the top predator of the ecosystem. There are mammalian predators, other theropods like abelosaurids and dromaeosaurs and more, but the population of juvenile zentar is quite a dominant presence. A twist on this is found in the Housie Prairie, the domain of the Uktan, 
The Uktan demonstrates prolonged parental care with fewer offspring, often keeping their young and providing food and defense well into their second decade. Since young Uktan are removed from the equation, the predator diversity of the Hausi prairie is much higher, although all still acknowledge the Uktan as king. This context seen in tyrannosaurs may well be a contributing factor to our final topic for this video, the overall decline in dinosaur biodiversity in the 10 million years leading up to the extinction event that wiped out all non-avian dinosaurs on Earth. Six dinosaur families were examined, predator and prey, and this pattern was seen across the board. Hadrosaur dominance putting pressure on other clades is cited by the authors, but the pressures put on predators by specializations of the tyrants may well be a factor as well. Whatever the reason, as is so often the case, a perfect storm culminated in the conclusion of the age of dinosaurs, and it seems a reduction in biodiversity, and in turn a reduction in species adaptability, likely made a dominant dinosaurs victims of their own success. A similar context played out in Chimere. Although the timeline was prolonged due to such devastations of meteor never occurring, over time the hadrosaurs and their tyrant predators became so dominant and specialized, so successful, that they were ultimately vulnerable to the slight changes in context because they had forged several continents to their preferences. They built a perfect world, got comfortable, and were entirely too vulnerable when the context changed. Non-avian dinosaurs continued to be the dominant clade, but it was different groups than those we associate with dominance in the end of the Cretaceous. The conclusion of their dynasty was devastating, and the arms race to fill the ecological void has led to a landscape of dread and competition, which defines the region to this day. Thank you all so much for tuning in. This will be my last video for a bit, going on a brief hiatus to work on The Lost Hellfighter through January. The Lost Hellfighter is a novel which follows Elijah, a veteran of World War I who finds himself trapped for a year in Chimere, and must face the conflicts not only in this new world, but those he's trying to escape from back on Earth. Many of the characters you met in my literary debut, Tales of Chimere, will be back for this, my first novel. In February, we will kick off with new videos, with the first few exploring apes of the known world, languages, dromaeosaurs, and several other requested topics in the following months. Thank you all so much for joining me today, and be sure to check out Raptor Chattel's channel tomorrow to continue on this journey of Paleo Rewind and learn some of the exciting paleontological studies and discoveries made in July of this year. Thanks to Edge for putting together this delightful project and celebrating all of the fantastic pieces added to the great puzzle of paleontology. Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and stay fantastic. I will see you all in February. Cheers, folks!